Our scripture lesson this morning is from the 15th chapter of the book of Luke, beginning at verse 11. Then Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and uh, traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began uh, to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the field to slop the hogs. Did you get that? He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to eat and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up, and I'll go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still afar off, his father saw him and filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command. And yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who was uh, devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and he's come back to life. He was lost and has been found. Thank you, Pepper. The parable of the lost son is really two stories in one. Now we are most familiar with the story of the prodigal son. He's the one who asked for his share of the inheritance from his father while his father was yet living. And when he received his inheritance, which would have, by the way, by Jewish law, been one-third of the total estate. The elder brother would have received two-thirds. This young man went off to a distant country, and there he squandered his money in what the King James calls riotous living. Oh, while he had money, Randy had lots of friends. Everyone was gathering around him. I call them moochers. Everyone loved him while he had money. In time, he would run out of money. 
And a great famine hit that land and he found himself in great need and the only place he could go to find employment was with a local farmer feeding the pigs. And oh, how he longed to even eat some of the pods that the pigs were getting because no one was giving him anything. And it's in that moment that perhaps at the very bottom of the barrel, he began to look up and say, you know, I've kind of come to my senses here. I really had it made back home, but now I'm so unworthy, but I will go back home and there I will plead with my father. I will tell him that I've sinned against heaven and against him. And I'll plead that he might take me on as one of his hired hands. At least then I'll know that I have something to eat and a warm, dry place to sleep. Now we'll get back to him in just a moment. But let me remind you that there's another story taking place while all this other stuff is going on. You see, the prodigal son had an older brother. Now this older brother was extremely loyal to his father. He worked day in and day out helping to manage what appears to be a rather sizable operation. And even though his father had many servants, he took it upon himself <clears throat> to work hard day in and day out so that everything would run smoothly. And it would certainly take some of the load off of his father. <clears throat> Day in and day out, he did what he was supposed to do. But underneath that facade of being the faithful, loyal son, he was fuming. He was fuming. Day after day, I go out here and I work myself to the bone. And now the work's even harder because of that brother of mine <clears throat> who left, off having the time of his life. And I can imagine <clears throat> hearing, him, hearing him saying things like, I never get to have any fun. All I do is work. Have you ever felt that way? All I do is work. <clears throat> I never get to have any fun. And I can certainly imagine him saying, I can't believe my dad just handed over all that money to him. When maybe in his heart he figured all along his younger brother was irresponsible. Now, all these internal feelings come to light when his younger brother finally comes to his senses and returns home. I love that scene in Scripture where the father, and I can imagine this isn't the only day that he was out there looking for his young son, but on this occasion, as he was out there and he saw his young son coming from a distance, he didn't stand around and say, well, here comes that scoundrel son of mine. He ran to him with open arms, ready to embrace him and kiss him and welcome him back home. That's what the father did. And when they got back, he ordered the servants to kill the fattened calf. 
And he placed a robe on him and gave him a ring. And that night, they had a party. There was music and dancing and steak on the grill. When the older brother came in from the field, he heard all the music, he heard the laughter, he heard all the sounds of a party, and he wanted to know what was going on, so he asked one of the servants. And the servant told him, your brother has come home, and your father has thrown a party, and he's killed the fattened calf and they're feasting and they're having a wonderful time of reunion then the older brother becomes angry he finds no reason to rejoice in the return of his brother and he turns angry and refuses to go in and celebrate with his brother. He refuses because inside his heart he can't believe that his father would throw a party for someone who has just wasted one-third of his father's estate. When he wouldn't go in, the father comes out and he pleads with him to come in and join them in the celebration. This brother of yours who was dead is now alive. He was lost and now he's found. <clears throat> but instead, he answers his father sharply saying, Look how long I have stayed here and served you. I never gave you a moment of grief. I was always faithful. <clears throat> I always did everything you asked me to do. And you've never thrown a party for me or my friends. <clears throat> this son of yours doesn't even call his brother by name. Threw away your money to prostitutes and who knows what else. And now he shows up and you're having a party. These are my words. It's not in the scripture, but I can hear him saying, I don't get it. I don't get it. Then the father says something that is hard for me to get out of my mind because it truly represents what God is saying to us. When he said, son, don't you understand? You're with me all the time. And all that I have is yours. All that I have is yours. Sometimes we fail to see the treasure that is right in front of our eyes. This simple statement from the Father tells it all. Let me ask you, has anyone in this room ever felt like you were the only one that ever did anything? Huh? Anyone in the choir? Yeah, I see that. <laughs> <clears throat> Any of you ever feel that way? You know, across the years in ministry, I've encountered lots of people, and on a number of occasions, I've encountered people who were taking care of a parent or someone close to them. All their brothers and sisters live way off somewhere else, hundreds of miles away. And maybe they come in once or twice a year. But I've heard some of these folks 
say to me, as much as I love mom or dad or whoever it is, I feel stuck. I feel stuck. Or maybe, maybe you've experienced something like this in the church. I'm told, statistically, that 20% of the people in the church do all the work. I don't know if that's true or false. That's just what I've heard. And if you're among that 20%, <clears throat> you've probably given faithfully of your time and talent and energy to the church, and you've been out here day in and day out doing the work of the Lord, and sometimes you feel like you're on an island. You feel like you're all alone. You feel like you're the only one doing anything. And then you start thinking, well, at my age, it sure would be nice if somebody else came along and stepped up to the plate. Here I am, stuck in this place while everyone else is having a grand old time. But in this story, <clears throat> we cannot help but recognize that this father represents God to us and demonstrates the love of God to us in mighty ways. And you know what? There are some hints here on how we can live a faithful life and still experience joy. For one thing, <clears throat> I ask you to remember that God sees your faithfulness and loves you for it. God sees your faithfulness and loves you for it. What we do in this life may not be so glamorous or glorious or anything of the sort. But in our faithfulness, remember this, needs are being met. <clears throat> and your witness is being lived out in a very real way. I imagine that this father, the father in this passage, prayed every day giving thanks for his older son who stuck by his side. I imagine he prayed every day to God giving thanks because of his faithfulness, because of his willingness to work so hard as he did. In the same way, God is thankful for every one of us, for our faithfulness in this journey. The father here in this account knew what it meant to have his son by his side. He knew what it meant because in this time, he knew that a whole lot of things were getting done that he couldn't do by himself. <clears throat> Remember this. God sees your faithfulness and loves you for it. Second, the Father says, you are always with me. We could say that in reverse and say that God is always with us, couldn't we? Now, I've talked a lot about that over the years, and I'm not going to dwell on it long. But it is such a glorious honor and privilege to know that our God is with us all the time. And in our faithfulness of being with God, we find ourselves drawing near to God every day of our lives. Don't forget that. That's what this season of Lent is all about, that we draw nearer to God. And finally, the Father said, all that I have is yours. <clears throat> The older brother didn't know how blessed he was. He really didn't know how blessed he was. 
Everything he needed or could ever want was right at his disposal. Everything. And yet he missed that because in his heart he was focused only on the things that frustrate him. He missed the mark in that way. We serve a God who has infinite resources. We serve a God who meets our needs every day. And as the scripture says, just ask and ye shall receive. There are really two stories in one going on here. The younger brother took his inheritance, went off and wasted every penny of it. But when he came to his senses and he returned to his father with a repentant and contrite heart, he found nothing but love. Isn't that good news? You can stray and God still loves you. Now, I'm not encouraging you to stray. I'm just saying that if you do, God still loves you. Isn't that good news? Amen. And if you are willing to be faithful, if you're willing to stay around and do the work, even when it appears like you're the only one, God loves you deeply for that as well. And all that God has is yours at your disposal. We are both loved by our Father. And I can assure you that because our Father loves us, <coughs> we can be assured that all that is there, all that God has, is at our disposal anytime we need it. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. I don't know which side you relate to. I, I never ask anyone to show a hand whether you feel more like the prodigal or whether you feel more like the older brother that stayed home. I won't ask you to do that. But if you're here today <coughs> and in your heart, <coughs> you really feel like the prodigal. You've gone down a path that is broad and in many ways leads to destruction because you've wasted a lot of years, a lot of opportunities to be faithful to God. Remember this, God loves you. And God is willing to meet you just where you are. In fact, God will run to you with open arms. And if you're here and you feel more like the older brother and you feel just stuck, trapped, and everyone else is having the time of their life, remember, God loves you. And everything that God has is yours. All you have to do is ask. So when we sing this closing hymn, wherever you find yourself relating, this place of prayer is open for you to come. It is open for you to come and pray and say, Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Let's pray.